I do tonight. And I hope spike edging is not really specifically plastic or aluminum because it's really the spike that, that fails over time with the separation. Uh, but this became one of my pet peeves. That I'm doing everything right. I'm extending my base, using the right materials, doing proper compaction, and I was using an edge restraint product that was, in my opinion, was letting me down. Um, and I know you don't have the quite the freezes uh, like we have in Ohio, uh, but you do have a lot of lot wet, wet weather and movement. And if you've been doing it long enough, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about uh, with being able to see a, a, a rail type edging um, a few years down the road uh, start to expose itself and separate. So we, um, I, I, I used concrete for a few years. I liked the speed of it. And that's when I got serious uh, back really 2012 when I really started messing with admixtures and then of course hired some folks that are way smarter than me to help me put together a formula, some really good engineers. But we'll hop into, hopefully you guys leave here today and you'll see, <clears throat> see the difference. Um, I know compared to some of the uh, other wet edge restraints, uh, Permint is gonna be the more expensive option. Um, so I'm here to tell you what the, 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 what, you know, what, what the benefits, what you're paying for, because uh, obviously money's important on our job sites um, to, to show you what you're getting. Um, <clears throat> So we definitely believe we're the best choice at wet edge restraints. Um, uh, and we're gonna go through some of, some of this, but these are kind of the highlights. Um, Non-porous aggregates, uh, way more flexible than concrete, um, and, so, and some of the other wet edges are more permeable. And I'm gonna show you why all those things are extremely important. Uh, we do sell permits currently at a five gallon bucket. Uh, we might have some surprises coming in March with some different packaging options. Um, so the non-porous aggregates, um, that's, that's very important. Uh, most concretes, say you go to you know, Menards, Lowe's, wherever, get your bag of concrete, most concretes are 80% aggregate. Uh, that's going to be your, your gravel, your sand, and then the other 20% is Portland cement. Uh, when we first when we first started uh, testing with permedge, we used porous aggregates, meaning uh, a lot of the limestones, some of the granites, they're very porous. Can't really see it with the naked eye, but it, it's going to absorb water like a sponge. Uh, it's going to stay wet for a while. So we started using porous limestone, and everything was pretty good. The benefit to that is that the Portland and everything will bond into the pores of that stone. Uh, the downfall uses a paper edging, you know, if, if it's concrete out here in the wide open, it gets sunlight and wind throughout the day, it can eventually dry out. When you're installing it as a paper edge, a lot of you guys are, you know, you're, you're finishing that off with either dirt and sod or, or mulch, maybe some decorative stone. Um, decorative stone can dry out a little bit quicker, but when you're covering that with mulch or dirt, when you have a non-porous, uh, I'm sorry, a porous aggregate in your concrete, that's gonna stay wet possibly for the life of the product. Uh, especially here where you get these little rains all the time, it never has a chance to thoroughly dry out. So that causes uh, deterioration over time. What you'll find in a, most concrete wet edges is you really won't see it up top, but it'll almost like rotted wood. As you can imagine, the bottom of that staying wet. So over time it just deteriorates and starts to shed off. So if you're using a bedding sand or a chip, now you've, you're allowing that bedding layer to wash out from underneath more native soils come in. So, so that's what you're seeing, especially in freeze situations, uh, it's obvious, it's staying wet, the, the aggregate in there is wet, you get a freeze, it's just, you're gonna get more cracking and things like that. Um, we did take a couple competing products. Um, again, we, we want to show the difference. We have nothing bad to say about the other products. We just want to tell you about our product. Um, but we did take a couple competing products, took the same amount of aggregate. So basically we sifted uh, the, the gravel out of them. Obviously we, we couldn't sift to get the sand separated from the Portland, but we did get the aggregate. Um, 
You can go to, yeah, so basically we took seven ounces of a couple of people <coughs> products. You gotta figure when we started this, the only competitor was concrete. So all of our stuff was, hey, what's the difference in permit and concrete? Um, and this, this is similar, but we wanted to show um, some of the things here. So we took seven ounces, we let them all soak in water for 24 hours. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, sat them out these drains, drained all the water off, um, and let them dry for 24 hours. So then we come back uh, to our results. Um, Permeds basically weighs the same amount as it did when we started. Uh, the others picked up 0 0.6, 0 0.8 ounces after 24 hours. That's That was just to show that that gravel re retained um, and held that water um, all in the same room and all that. So wanted to show you that. We also, um, you know, with the, the flexor all strength the permits. That, that, that was just to show that our aggregate, when I'm talking about the pores versus the non pores, um, we, we've done a lot of testing. We, we continue to test. So we, we did lots of tests, field tests. Uh, we're in a fortunate position in our area. There's a University of Dayton uh, that we've been able to use their senior project. So. When we first started, we, we hired a you know, fancy engineering lab and the testing was outrageous. It works out good with the university because the seniors use it as their final uh, exam. And basically they, they test whatever we're looking to test. We usually do that two, sometimes three semesters a year with the university. So the students get to work on real life projects um, and it's overseen by the, the professors in the school. So we, we are like, we're doing some testing now. So we're constantly testing. So all, all of the, the, uh, the, 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 the tough part is you have to file ASTM standard testing. So when you're doing the Flexerol test or the, the PSI, you have to follow you know, the, your slabs to be certain, certain size. Uh, but we've done all of our testing there. So, we can't really speak, I don't know about the other products where their product te testing is with flex for all permeability. Uh, unfortunately, I've never seen those numbers. Maybe they're out there, but, so this is basically talking about the difference between permits when you buy a bag of concrete. Uh, permits is about 783% more flexible than the concrete you're gonna buy in a bag. Um, obviously, you're not gonna be able to just bend it, but it's gonna, we stand a lot more flexing on your base than standard concrete. Um, so basically you're, you're going to get, that's just a picture, about three pounds of a desensitized silica fume goes into every bucket of permanent. And that really, um, that's where a lot of the flexural strength comes from along with the macro fiber that we use in our product. Um, the, the macro fibers, um, Again, that testing, we continue to test. We, when we first brought the product to market in 2016, we had more of a, a lot of you guys might like, it, they call it cat hair, like that fine fiberglass that they'll put in driveways and things um, that you don't see, really see. Um, so we tested some different fibers. CP came out with some different fibers that we tested. Um, and so that's just an example. I'd say, you know, Competition B, similar in size to the fibers that we have, A, not so much. Um, and that's, you know, that there's, ours may have a little more fiber. It can be really touchy. Um, more isn't always better. So as we're testing fibers, uh, like Sika, for instance, has a recommended amount you should use for each application. You can go online and find that. So we had to test like, you know, one and a half times the amount of fiber, two times the amount of fiber, to find out which was the best. Because 2X actually made it worse because it was fibers laying on top of fibers. So, um, so the fiber is going to help uh, with flexural strength. And we don't claim permits is never going to crack. Sometimes it's real windy or real hot. You might get a sprawl crack the day of install. That's kind of a superficial crack on, on the surface. Um, but those fibers are going to keep it from coming apart. Uh, and sometimes what can be misleading is, you know, perma edge is, is just like concrete as far as curing time goes. Um, you know, it, it's going to be 28, 30 days before the product is fully cured and, and performing to
to all the standards that we speak about. You know, two, three days later, it might still be a little fragile. Of course, you don't have to worry about that on your job. Your customers don't have to wait to use their patio or any, anything like that. But just wanted to touch on the fibers. Um, permeability. So we, we get a lot of questions about this. Your, um, you know, you're not going to watch water come out the other side of permit. So it's not. But compared to concrete, so we use another fume, which we do. Basically, it's called chemical air treatment. Um, sometimes you can add air to concrete on a job site pneumatically, literally pumping air to the concrete. And that creates little air pockets, uh, similar to like an open graded base or anything like that. You're providing void space that water is able to collect without cracking by pressure. So we use um, a, a different fume to get our air treatment. Um, that goes in every bucket of permits as well. And we're, we're about over 40% more permeable than standard concrete. Another side of that is not only the chemical air treatment, but it's also the non porous aggregates that I talked about. So you can imagine 80% of that product won't allow water in. So that, that's a big part of that as well. Um, to show some of that, we, we did basically a cured sample. Um, it was really hard for us to get them the way the exact amount we made a ton of them. So they're really close. Uh, 6.2 ounces, 6.4, 6.4. Uh, you can even see a little spot up there. I had to chip a little section off because it was really hard to get them equal weights as much as I measured. But we basically, I basically put together like hockey puck type sizes um, and then we soak those in water. Um, we soak those in water for 24 hours, let them dry for 48 hours, uh, same room, same temperature. So basically there's our results. That was a, uh, you know, somewhat significant, about a, a, an ounce more, um, or, you know, than, than, uh, than our, uh, some of them, two ounces. Now permanent still way more, if you want to go back and show Kevin, uh, two more. You know, we, we still wait an ounce more 48 hours later, because there's still moisture draining out of that. But the other ones were closer to two, so they were draining out much, much slower. Um, so just, just uh, we really did that for ourselves and to kind of help show people the benefit of that edge restraint um, staying dry and that we are using things that actually make that happen. Um, so as I talk about all of these things, um, you know, obviously there's strength, um, flexor all strength, permeability, and even early on when I was testing, working with the engineers, um, I knew what I wanted, but in my mind, all I could think is, man, this stuff's gotta really be strong, right? If I'm gonna market it to, to all the contractors, it's, I've gotta be some really high, you know, eight, 9,000 PSI. And so our testing was coming in around 4,500, the 4,800 PSI, and I kept telling the engineer, what, what can we add to this? And finally, he set me aside. He said, look, I think you're going about this all wrong. Um, <clears throat> at a thin profile like a paper edging, if you get too strong, any little movement is just going to snap. It's going to be fragile. Uh, maybe if you're doing a four, six thick in, six, four to six inch pour, but not as a paper edging. And that's what really sent us down the road of, yeah, we, we want to make sure it's strong, but the flexibility and permeability are more important for the specific uses of paper edging. Um, so that's sometimes I, I hear, you know, the other products, oh, we're much stronger. Or, I, don't, I don't know what those numbers are, but it's really not all about the strength. So we, a lot of our testing continues, just like when we changed our fiber in, in 2008, late 18, we had to test all the other numbers because when you change one number, now you're gonna look, well, what did that do to the other number? You know, if, if I become stronger, I'm not as flexible. If I get too flexible, I'm not very strong. So a lot of our testing revolves around topping out all of those numbers as high as we can without affecting the other one by, by you know, any major amount to make sure we keep the integrity. But the flexor all strength um, and, the, and the permeability are really what's 
we've seen with testing, even the freestyle testing we've done, is, is really where, where it's at for paper etching. Uh, not so much about how strong it is. Um, the packaging, um, that, that was very important to us. Um, as a contractor, nothing more than I painted was having broken bags or wasted materials. Um, but we, you know, of course, if you use firm edge, you got stacks and stacks of buckets probably, um, which are nice so you run out of uses for them. But, um, but anyways, we, we may, uh, we are possibly looking at, at offering the bucket and the bag. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, hopefully by March, we'll have those offerings that will, uh, the buckets are expensive, so that'll help if, if guys aren't too concerned with the bucket. Um, or have buckets that you can transfer uh, product in. Uh, but the bucket is really nice, especially with the rain. You get here, um, Western Interlock can deliver you. It can be delivered with your pavers. You don't have to worry about rain or, or wasted product. Has anyone that used Permeds, have you ever opened up the bucket and had hard material inside? You did? Once. It was, was there a crack in the lid or something? Uh, not that I can wear. Okay. Was the whole bucket hardened or was just really? Wow. That's a threat. That's water got in somehow, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we the reason I asked about a hole in the lid, we've got a hydraulic bucket closer at the factory. And sometimes if it's not calibrated right, it'll leave it'll right in the center of the lid. It'll and you can't hardly see it. So we constantly have people check. I mean it doesn't happen very often, but that yeah. it, it's hard to see, so that may have been what happened. Did, did, were we able to get you credit for oh, that? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, it's going to be pretty rare uh, that, that you, you know, you, even if you want to use half the bucket and seal the lid back on, it, as long as you didn't mix it with water, uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to last in that bucket. Um, I guess just so I get your opinions, make it a little interactive. If you've used Permeds, would Raise your hand if you prefer it to be in a bag to save the money and for some cost savings. To save money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was just curious, you know, which, who, who would rather buy it in a bucket than in a bag? I guess it, de it depends on, like you said, the time of year. You know, we get, you know, 98% of our papers delivered to our job site. So, summertime, I get a like, base of light sand in the bag. Right. Like, you know, no problem. Winter time. Yeah. Very nice yeah. yeah. But uh, it'd be nice to have the options. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we will, if we do, um, well, I shouldn't say if, if we plan on offering the bag, we won't do away with the bucket. Um, just there's, there's too many people really like the bucket. and. Uh, but yeah, we, we will have other options um, as far as that goes. How many pounds of the bag do you? What's that? So how many pounds of the bag do you? Just 50. 50. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it would be a 50 pound bag. Will so be, a little lighter. <laughs> will it be plastic? Plastic bag? Yeah. Yeah. We've been testing bags. It's hard to, there's so many different kind of uh, bags out there. It won't be like a, a plastic bag. But you won't be able to leave it outside. Yeah. Um, even when you look at a bag, you know, like some of the poly sands say they're waterproof, and we all are usually not. Um, uh, some of them work better than others, uh, but uh, Portland cement's a lot more touchy to moisture than than, uh, than the sand. So pretty hard. Yeah, you definitely have to leave it tarp. Or, um, what we're thinking too, if you use permit and you, you have a bunch of buckets, if it matters that much when you get the bags in, just have a guy take 30 minutes and transfer them into the, the old buckets you have and now you're waterproof. Um, we do that with my heart shape company. We'll, we'll get a skin of poly sand in and we'll just transfer it immediately into the buckets and mark it with the Sharpie. Grass seeds, fertilizer, anything that can get wet on the job, we use all of our buckets for that. So. If you're not, you've got permit buckets. It, it's a nice way to kind of waterproof all your stuff, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, takes a little time, but you know, days like today when you're working in the shop, just a, just an idea to mark them all. 
Um, so just kind of the history. Again, we, we sold our first skin at, uh, at the end of 2016. Um, really sold our first truckload at the end of 2017. Like I said, I'm a hardscaper just like you guys. I've kind of, I still have my hardscape company. I run about four guys. Um, still do all my own design and sales. I'm fortunate enough to have a couple guys that work for me, been with me over 12 years. That allows me to uh, work permanent. So it is definitely my passion is the hardscape industry. Um, coming up with this entry straight, to me, of course, when you're running a business, it's just nice to be successful or make money and, and those things. But the biggest thing for me was to find a better solution. Um, to, to what was available. I, I, I you know, there's gotta be something better than pounded spikes. Um, so the quality is the big thing. Um, so that, that, that's, to me, that's what's priced. And I, I think a lot of you can attest that, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I hear everything from one year, three year, five year warranty. Is anyone in here doing longer than a five year warranty on their projects? Yeah, it's pretty un uncommon. Um, but that that is, I, I think a lot of us can agree, one of the first places you're going to see a, a failure, if there is one, is on the edge. It's it's very rare um, to find failure in other areas unless you've got way bigger problems. You know, didn't use the proper base, you're getting sinking. Um, really, the only repair you know issues that we've ever had is either on the edge or like a glue failure is typical uh, sometimes. So that, that was the big thing, is to make sure that you had a quality product that would, that would last uh, much longer. And, and at minimum, get you past warranty terms on whatever. Uh, you know, permanent's gonna last a lot longer than that, but the, uh, the, the thing that means the most, I think, is I'm sure a lot of you in here get, a lot of your work comes from referrals. You know, people see your work, customers talk about what a great job you did. So, the longer that edge stays together, the longer you're going to get referrals, the longer your project is, is going to look good and, and stay um, together. But, you know, based on our sales, I mean, we, we roughly have 720 to 800 miles of permit uh, around the United States and Canada on projects. Um, we have had a few calls on failed product. Two, two of them were, were not our product. Um, you know, but they were very important to me. Two of them I drove over five hours to look at. Um, and um, one, fortunately, was, was local to, to me, which is pretty rare. Uh, literally 20 minutes from my house. Um, pretty large landscape company out by us, landscape nurse, class nursery. Sales guy I'd never met before. He was actually kind of really mean to me about it, telling me how it, you know, you use my product, you can't believe it fails. So, Long story short, I get out there, and they, they didn't remove their bedding layer, was number one. So the edging was right on top of some like sandy nines, and about a quarter inch thick, flat. Um, the kicker was, is it wasn't even our product. I think it was concrete or something else. Um, because when I saw it, I about died. I'm like, oh my goodness, this stuff's cracked up horrible. It wasn't our product, and then he was very apologetic. But we, we haven't, um, knock on wood, uh, we, we have not had calls and complaints. Um, but of course it also takes uh, you guys to do your part. You know, if you're not extending your base and doing proper compaction and, and all those good things, no edging is gonna work very well for you. You know, if, if you don't put it on a stable base um, on the outside there. Um, so, Obviously, we're, we're on social media, so if any of you do Instagram or Facebook, you can find us on there. Uh, if you haven't followed our page, it'd, it'd be great if you did. And uh, There's also some videos and things on there. And our website also offers, uh, there's a whole uh, page of little YouTube videos. So most of your questions that you may have, uh, you know, about compaction or when can I do this, when can I do that, most of those are on our website. Um, that you that you can find, um, but if you if, if you're using the product or you know, have any questions, you, you feel free to reach out uh, to myself, um, call our office, or you can message me on Instagram or whatever. 
um, we'll be happy to do that. Um, I'm going to go in some some other, uh, other, some other things. Um, I know we got some demos to do outside, um, but I'll go over some more install stuff for people that haven't used the product. Um, does anyone have questions on anything that I just <coughs> talked about? Um, so yeah, so for install, for those of you that haven't used Permedge, you're going to use one gallon of water per five gallon bucket. Kind of takes the guesswork out of it. Every now and then, it's pretty rare, is that one gallon's not going to be enough water. Um, at the end of our run, sometimes we're and we try to do away with it best we can. Every now and then, there'll be a little more Portland in there. If it's really thick, just add a little water. But um, if you don't have a gallon jug, you can put three inches of water in, it, in one of our buckets. Uh, that's that we use it as a, a measuring cup, basically. Um, and if you don't do any of that, just mix it to a thick oatmeal consistency. Uh, the one thing I will advise is just make sure it's a little bit on the wetter side. If, if it's on the dry side, it's going to be going to give you fits trowing it out. You want to make sure it's workable. Um, you guys can compact right away. We recommend that you do compact while it's wet. If something happens, you get pulled from the job site and you weren't able to compact. That's okay too. You can come back the next day. It's a cold joint. It's just going to break. It's just going to set in. But we do prefer wet. It gives you more like a filled in. It was all wet when you compacted and it just tends to lock things in better. And if you're using, if, if you're using an open graded style base or, or not even full open graded, like a, like a hybrid where you've got chips for your bedding, I think it's a little more important to compact while it's wet because uh, you know if you've done it before, if you're using bed or like sandy nines, there's quite a bit of moisture in them. So when you pull that bedding layer back away, the sand stays put. With your chips, you'll get undermining. It'll roll out, sometimes up to an inch, inch and a half. I've seen it come out pretty deep because you're, it's so important that you're scratching down to your three-quarter stone. Um, using chips, you know, you, you don't have to do super clean. You're going to get a ton of other money. You just want to make sure you're scraping that bedding layer down um, till you get to your three-quarter dense or open grade, whichever you're using. And that's really, really important. Um, I've been surprised with the travel I do and trainings. You'd be blown away by how many hardscapers do not realize that they should be removing that bedding layer. Um, so that's really important, no matter what style edging that you're using. The main purpose of paper edging really is to create a dam. You're basically damming in that bedding layer. If that bedding layer can never erode out or dirt can't erode into it, your edge should not fail. Um, yeah, it catches the lip of the paper, but it's not the main purpose. The main purpose is to retain that bedding layer. So just keep that in mind as you're installing and edging. So with open graded base, when you get that undermining, permanent will fill that void. Whereas you're, if you're using a rail or stick edge with spikes, they're pretty much impossible. You're either gonna have to try to skew to get your, it, it, but you're, to do it right, really, you'll have to remove those edge bricks after you get your edging set, level the chips back out and reinstall the papers. Most people don't worry about that, but that little inch of undermining, that, that's eventually gonna level out. It's eventually gonna flatten out. So uh, with permits, you don't, have, you don't have to worry about that. Um, there's, uh, you, you can fine grade everything right away. You can come in immediately with your soils or mulch, um, anything like that. I know you don't get a lot of freezing weather out here, so I don't think it's a big issue, but if you are working with permits and it's, it's below freezing, um, there's a couple things you can do. The easiest is you can add one cup of calcium per five gallon bucket of permits. That's the easiest. Just get some straight calcium, um, one cup per five gallon bucket. Uh, you're gonna have to get it installed and you know, don't let it sit <laughs> by harden up on you. Big thing is to keep that water from free or keep keep the water from freezing. You know, it getting dry before the water freezes. Um, but with your mild freezes here, I don't even. You know, if you even put a tarp over it or raked over some native mulch or soil just to hold the ground heat, 
um, you're fine. You just want to want it to dry out before the water and it freezes is the big thing. Um, I know uh, concerning even like the rain, um, if, if it's going to be a lighter, moderate rain, go ahead with it. Um, the permits will be fine. Every now and then, if it, it rains a little hard, if it, you know, it's, it's going to be a downpour, you're going you're gonna to have to hold off. But I know a lot of you, unless maybe a lot of them are using easy joint, um, you know, the, the sanding and edging go hand in hand, right? Get guys out there sweeping your sand in, do an edging, do your first compaction. Um, so, you know, depending on the, the joint sand you're using, you may or may not be doing it in the rain anyways. Um, but, but you can, as long as it's not, uh, you know, going to be a pretty brutal rain. If it's light or moderate rain, you can move forward with it. Um, we are going to do some dinner outside, so I, I won't talk too much about these things, but I'll show you more in person. One thing that's really important when, when for your installers or anyone installing this, and I even get on my guys quite a bit about it, I think everyone thinks more is better. So I think we have the tendency to come real high up on the brick. Um, one, if you come real high, you're not going to be able to go grass very well. But there's actually a functional reason to stay low as well. Uh, we recommend as a rule of thumb, stay on the bottom one third of your paver thickness. So, you know, two and three eighths inch paver standing, I, I would stay half inch or less. I mean, if you go a little bit of, you guys don't have to be out there with a tape measure or anything, just keep it low. I would be more concerned on staying low on the brick than, than, than going high. And, and the reason being is, when you come high on the brick, if you have movement, um, whether it's freestyle movement or, or movement, that brick can heave, and when it settles back down, you're going to have a gap where it pushed out on the edging. If you stay low, then it's more of a pivot point. Everything's going to move together, and you're going to get more linear footage out of the bucket. Um, so you, you know you be cheaper to go on higher, um, and so. You can go wider if you like, just don't go off your base into the native soil. Don't ever travel off, off, off the base. Um, you know, sometimes when you have corners that might push out over time or you're concerned, maybe it's a, on a steep hill or something, sometimes I'll, I typically beef up my corners anyways. Any 90s or corners, I'll, I'll really pack the permits to get around those corners. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll get into some things you may saw on the table over there. Does it do any of you do paver driveways in here? So, yeah, uh, we're not going to try to, uh, you know, ICPI for instance recommends a concrete curb for all driveways, and I don't want to deter you from that. Uh, but the fact is, 90, 95 percent of contractors do not price a concrete curb in the driveway residential. It's usually not in the budget. So if your option is, hey, I'm going to have to use a standard edging, I'm not going on the concrete curb, um, I believe we have the best option for that. Um, and, and we'll kind of talk about it outside. Uh, Western Airlock set up a nice little area out back here that we can do some more hands-on stuff. Um, but you're basically going to use like a bilateral geo grid or a drive grid. Um, more is better. Uh, but you're going to run that on top of your three-quarter stone, then your bedding, then your pavers, to where you plan it, where you're going to have four to six inches of that grid beyond the edge of the paver. <coughs> so now you've got all this grid, you got bedding in the grid, you got the weight of the pavers, then you lock it in on the edge of the permit. Uh, makes it very strong. Um, some, a lot of people I've seen on straight driveways, they'll run the grid all the way across the driveway. So now you've got, you're locked in. You, you almost be impossible to pull back. But at minimal, we recommend two feet. I, I would like to see guys going more like a four foot roll of grid. Uh, if you're going two feet, just take your quickie saw and cut the whole roll in half. But I, I prefer on a driveway to see, see four feet um, on that. Um, the only the only part um, sometimes can be tricky because I know a lot of you um, like to overlay and cut. Uh, so if you've got to overlay and cut, you just have to be a little careful on not going all the way through your bedding layer with the saw, or you're going to cut that geo grid. 
But um, but yeah, uh, we're gonna take a little break. You guys gotta go to the bathroom, um, get something to drink before we before we go outside and do some hands-on stuff. Um, anybody got any questions? So I think outside. Oh, hey, Tom. So, um, it comes up a lot. So, people used to ask me this all the time, and I, I mean, I personally, uh, you know, for like Gator Base, it was funny, I was doing one in Ohio like two or three years ago, and the vice president from the Lions was there. And I always recommend people, I want you to succeed with whatever you're doing. I, I don't, if, if they're the better fit, I think, you know, the permits, I want you to use that. So I always tell people I would use the edging that they recommend, the, 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 the screws that come with it, with their edging that locks right to the gator base. Because I, I always felt like, you know, if something goes wrong, they're gonna say, well, you didn't use our edging. Uh, but I was saying that, and the guy from Alliance like, hey, we love permits, you can use them with our product. And of course that was why, because they come up with something like it later on. But um, if you're going to use it with a synthetic base, I would recommend that where the problem lies is you really can't put it right on top of a synthetic base. Now if it's like, a, there's one called click base, that you can't because it's got buoys that'll grab the perma edge and, and, and dentions and it, it's pretty rock solid. Uh, SHS out on the East Coast has done quite a few demos and videos with that using that click base. But something like gator base or a foam base like that, it's gonna break away if you put it on top. So where the issue lies is what, what we've done and other people, what you can cut, we, if you're gonna use it, we recommend cut, just cutting it flush with the pavers. The problem with that is depending on what zone you're in, you don't really have anything there to put it on top of. Maybe two inches of sand or some guys, guys who use chips. So it really depends on what's, on the outside of that, if you have something stable to put it on for it to last. Yeah, um, that's a great question. What we don't recommend, and um, some of the others do, and I'm, I'm not really sure where they're going with it, but I would not recommend Perma Edge on a, if you do concrete overlays. Um, Perma Edge, it, it's gonna be a cold joint. If you go put Perma Edge right on top of concrete, it's eventually just gonna, uh, you know, I know they're very sealed floors, but we do a lot of trade shows and events, and we'll install the permits right on top of their floor. And when we're done, we just take a spade, and it pops right up, clean. So, um, you know, if you do concrete overlays, you may already know. In my opinion, I'd be using aluminum with the pneumatic nails. Pretty bulletproof on top of concrete. Uh, we have run into instances where They've done a concrete overlay, but it comes right to the edge of the concrete. Now you're good, but you still need to dig down and get at least four inches of base in there compacted before you put the permit. So just keep those things in mind. Um, you know, if you got the edge of that concrete and think you're just going to put permit right on top of the dirt, it, it's going to work, but it's not going to hold up for very long because you're just sitting right on top of the dirt. So you definitely need base under the product for it to perform um, properly. Um, and it, it is good on either dense or open grading. Um, when we first started developing the product, I was developing all based on dense grades from sand. So it's not just for open graded base. And the reason that it works so well is because it's just, it, if you install it properly, it's gonna be kind of come one with your patio install. And it's going to float and flex with your patio, not work independently. Um, and so that's why we just needed to make sure it wasn't going to deteriorate and crack all up. And that's what we did with all the admixtures and the mountain forest aggregates. Um, but um, you know, if you stay low on the paper, you're going to be able to grow grass just fine. Um, I do know, uh, you know, some people do have problems with they call me and say, hey, I'm not growing grass very good. Typically, they, man, they came you know, a quarter, half inch from the top of the pavement with the permit. 
you're not going to be able to grow grass on that for the first few inches. So if you stay low, um, you know, taking the minimal thickness you're going to use is two and three eighths. So if you stay low, you should be able to get an inch and a half to inch and three quarter of soil right there at the paper, and then you've got more more soil after that. And because it's not really zapping the moisture, um, it does grow grass better than a concrete, um, just because that's zapping, it's drawing more of the moisture out of the soil. Um, I believe, um, Nathan, for the permit out there, we do the mixer setup. Is that what we're using? The, no, the no, auger? Yeah. I don't have a mixer. Um, um, shovel. Oh, um, shovel. Yeah. Good, good. That's, well, that's how we do Yeah. So you have all of the tools already to install permits. You know. um, typically, and I'd love your opinions on this as well. So we, we find it, uh, of course, it depends on the, the brands you're using if you're doing curves. Uh, but we find it usually will speed you up on your edging install by 50% um, right around in that area. Again, it depends on if you're doing curves. If you're doing a curve, you got to cut the notches out. If you're putting a spike every foot like you should be using a rail edging, um, it will typically speed you up. Once you get accustomed to using it, and that's something I'm going to go with outside, I do see a lot of guys, it, it's really quick to install. You know, I see some guys do videos and they're kind of messing around with it. And it's really fast if, if you're on a wide open job. A lot of guys, you know, if they're doing 40, 50 lineal foot of edging, you'll mix two buckets at once in a wheelbarrow. And two guys usually install that mix to finish in six, seven minutes. So, you know, that's pretty comparable to nine strips of, of edging. Um, I know... Um, did, did, didn't you on your contractor day, did, weren't you telling me about the, the people that you chose permits? Yeah, so the, the people that were there, the top three placers in our Speedway competition use permit. So it's, I mean, it's faster. Yeah. So, I mean, and from my opinion, like we do uh, the, the, our YouTube videos, and Colin and Cody and myself, we're out there working, and I don't do it every day. I mean, I'm a desk jockey, right? So the last thing that I want to do is get out there and count a bunch of spikes. So when we started using permit on those, I mean, it was a game changer for me because I'm already wore out, and we, you just, it goes down so fast. But yeah, that, the, for the people that were there, I mean, I know, don't know if you noticed or not, but the, the speed lake competition, it was it was night and day. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you mix it right in the bucket? Yeah, and that, and, uh, that, that's why I asked, so we, you can use a paddle mixer on a drill. We, we make, um, we don't, but one of our dealers out in East Coast, they, they make these augers, just like an auger for your bobcat, but for a drill. So it's not fighting the product, it's augered up, it mixes it really quick. Um, I'm still old school, I like the wheelbarrow, because I just take it right around with me, where I'm thinking, boom, boom, boom. Uh, my guys, on the other hand, <laughs> I think mean, time is money, right? Plus their backs. It is easier. It mixes really quick if you're set up and ready to go. You do have to have an empty bucket because it's, you know, when you get a bucket of permits, it's usually about that far from the top full. So you do need to kind of, like say for instance, we're putting five buckets of permits. Guys will bring five empty buckets. And if you don't have that many, you can just do them one or two at a time. But they'll split them so they got 10 buckets. Just kind of half the water. I mean, they're mixed and ready to go. You can even use the bucket to, to lay it out. So you're not dirty in the wheelbarrow. The auger's way quicker. It's easy to rinse off. So it is very efficient to use that auger bit. And if any of you are interested in one, just reach out to us and we have one direct ship to you. I think they're about 50 bucks. Um, they sell, you know, what by ship. We don't make any money on them. We just try to help it if you like it and all that bit. Um, but, um, and I forget, Kevin, did, did you give me that one? Yeah, yeah so we have, one to, we have one to show you. Yeah, yeah, but it, 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 it does help. But it, it, you don't have to have it. You know, you've all done it without it. Um, it's, uh, you know, typically we'll mix and a guy will come along with a scoop shell. Another guy slamming it out. And, and, and then you've got all the little benefits, right? 
no chance of running a spike through an irrigation head. You know, no chance of running into rock. Uh, there's, there's all those little benefits as well. And, um, you know, of course, if you're doing open graded base, uh, although I hear it's a little tougher to get the aggregate for it, um, you, you really can't use a spike edging anyways. I mean, spikes just are not gonna stick to open graded, um, open, open graded install like that. Um, Kevin, do you have anything? You know, I kind of jumped all over. I want to make sure I don't miss something or that I should have talked about. Oh, yeah. No, I think you got at the end there. That was a good point. Um, so that's a big reason we see a lot of, um, especially as you get a little farther east where irrigation becomes kind of king. They're going to have any sort of green in their landscape. Um, so everyone has uh, irrigation lines running through. And just that one or two times and unexpectedly finding a line and put a, putting something through it, um, yeah, it tends to work out really well. Um, and I'm excited to talk, you know, the, the geo grid, I think is, um, it's gonna be really nice to show. It's hard to, you know, I've seen a, a lot of installs out here about done a lot of jobs and uh, just to kind of go over how that works and why it works and, um, yeah. You know, you know, yeah, and, and you know the geo grid. I say for driveways, but there's quite a few contractors that are. I mean, they're using on pedestrian jobs as well, just to give themselves like pretty much bulletproof. You know, uh, I've seen guys using it on walkways and um, some patios and things like that. Uh, you don't have to, but you know, it's a, about the integrity of your project. So if you want to, it's not a bad option. It's just going to take you a little extra step. Um, to get to get that done, um, how how many um, are are any of you really installing on exclusively on open graded base or clear base? You are I'm starting to yeah. Starting to. Anybody else? That you you do sometimes the sequoia. Yeah. So Chris, was it's pretty difficult to get aggregates here in the Lab Valley. But we do have on on our app, I don't know if anybody's using our app, it's it's app.westlandlaw.com. We have an aggregate located on there and it, we have, it, should, it tells what the quarries have on there. So if you're wanting to find something in Oregon, we're still working on the Washington, um, but for Oregon we have it, it shows where you can get the different aggregates. So it is, it's difficult to find. So like down uh, Corvallis, the, what's the one that the pit down there? Top view. Yeah, Top they, view they, have it. It. they have it. But like in the Portland Metro, it's really difficult to find. Well, they have it. We buy it. We, yeah, we have it here. Yeah, we can ship it too. So it's, you know, it's, it can be cost effective if you're working with our minimum freight brackets and our maximum freight brackets. Just so you guys know. So if you need a couple of yards of quarter in or something for your figures out, then we can get it to you cost effective. Well, that's great. It sounds like a great tool to, to use. What's the website name? It's app.westernlaw.com. Or you can go to westernlaw.com, scroll down to the bottom and say use our app. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's not an app store, it's a web app. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Yeah. What made you, um, just the benefits you've read about to go over to Overgraded? Yeah, we have two quarries within 20 miles from where we work and have open grade. So, right. uh, so that's why we went that way. To, and it, we can work in any other pretty much. Yeah. Sense, so it right. runs 95% of the time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we, um, I said I've been hard for 30 years. We, we pretty much, around us in Ohio, it's just accessible everywhere. You know, every pit's got what you want. Um, so it's a little more accessible, but we we switched over um, probably about four, four-ish years ago. And um, definitely if you, you're able to get the aggregate. Obviously it's not for every application. There might be an application or two that, that it's not. And it's important that you, you run, you may have to run drainage for some of them or a trench that runs away because it, it may collect water like a pond. 
up against the house, but we, we almost do every install with it. And I really wish, um, man, I wish I would have started doing it 10 years ago. Um, on a, on a five, 600 day or five, 600 square foot patio. Yeah, and I only run a three, four man crew with my hardscapes. We, it, it probably shaved off a whole day for us going up and grade, in my opinion, because we do dense base, we would final our, our base and get it perfect. So you have that exact one inch of sand because any dip's going to hurt you. And with the clear base, you don't have to be that particular with it. Um, they, they say that the clear stone with no fines, angular, it's about 95% compacted just when you put it on the ground. It just consolidates when you run a compactor on it. So that saved us a lot. We can put four, six inches in and compact instead of two inch lifts. Working through the rain, of course in Ohio, we get a lot of freeze weather. But you can imagine how many times we try to work through the winter, we had to pull the dump truck in the barn and run the torpedo here, so I left a two ton of chips and dust back there that froze up solid. The clear stone doesn't have fines in it. So it might be a little stiff, but it doesn't freeze. Um, so for us, that was huge. Uh, working through the water, things like that, uh, the rain, um, which I know you guys get a lot of. So if you're able to check it out, I think it's definitely worth um, looking into. We weren't having problems on dig space with sand um, per se. You know, they were holding up and we're getting callbacks. But once I, I started using them for granted, I do think it's a, a, a bit better of a build. Um, and, and you're taking the fines out of the equation. Um, I guess, too, if, if any of you do natural stone work, flagstone pathways, things like that, I'll touch on that a little bit. You definitely can use perma edge on it. What, what I will say is if you're doing like a gravel, sand bedding, or even a clear base install with flagstone, um, it will work, obviously, if you've got an a irregular edge, pretty impossible to run a paper edge, you know, a, a, a rail type edge on that anyways. Perm edge will work and hold your bedding layer in, but you may get a little separation over time. And the reason being is because perm edge was developed as a paper edging that has interlock. As you all know, with irregular stone, you know, they might have one to three, four inch gaps and they're all independent, you know, so someone can step on one side of one or, you know, you, I, I just let you know what they expect. And once you put it in and a year later you go, Chris, I got a quarter inch gap. You're, it's gonna happen with natural stone, but it's gonna stay in place and hold your bedding layer in. So it does allow you to keep that irregular edge um, and, and, walk, and walk it out. Um, so yeah, it's, um, you know, here you get a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, so it's, it's really going to hold up much longer than a concrete, um, and pretty confident some of the, the competition. Um, but um, if you haven't used it, I, I hope you encourage you to. Like I said, Kevin, I'm sure would be happy if it's your first time. Um, and then, like I said, when we're outside, we'll go over some of the uses of, of the geo grid and stuff like that. So, anybody got any questions? No? Maybe uh, take a break, hit the bathroom, whatever, before we go outside.